Fox and Hound Taken from Birds and Bees Sharp Eyes and Other Papers by John Burroughs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fox and Hound I stood on a high hill or ridge one autumn day, and saw a hound run a fox through the fields far beneath me. What odors that fox must have shaken out of himself, I thought, to be traced thus easily, and how great their specific gravity not to have been blown away like smoke by the breeze. The fox ran a long distance down the hill, keeping within a few feet of a stone wall, then turned a right angle and led off for the mountain, across a plowed field and a succession of pasture lands. In about fifteen minutes the hound came in full blast with her nose in the air and never once did she put it to the ground while in my sight. When she came to the stone wall, she took the other side from that taken by the fox, and kept about the same distance from it, being thus separated several yards from his track, with the fence between her and it. At the point where the fox turned sharply to the left, the hound overshot a few yards, then wheeled and feeling the air a moment with her nose, took up the scent again, and was off on his trail, as unerringly as fate. It seemed as if the fox must have sowed himself broadcast as he went along and that his scent was so rank and heavy that it smelled in the hollows and clung tenaciously to the bushes and crevices in the fence. I thought I ought to have caught a remnant of it as I passed that way some minutes later, but I did not. But I suppose it was not that the light-footed fox so impressed himself upon the ground he ran over, but that the sense of the hound was so keen. To her sensitive nose these tracks steamed like hot cakes, and they would not have cooled off so as to be undistinguishable for several hours. For the time being she had but one sense, her whole soul was concentrated in her nose. It is amusing when the hunter starts out of a winter morning, to see his hound probe the old tracks to determine how recent they are. He sinks his nose down deep into the snow so as to exclude the air from above, then draws a long full breath, giving sometimes an audible snort. If there remains the least effluvium of the fox, the hound will detect it. If it be very slight, it only sets his tail wagging. If it be strong, it unloosens his tongue. Such things remind one of the waste, the friction that is going on all about us, even when the wheels of life run the most smoothly. A fox cannot trip along the top of a stone wall so lightly but that he will leave enough of himself to betray his course to the hound for hours afterward. When the boys play, quote, hare and hounds, the hare scatters bits of paper to give a clue to the pursuers, but he scatters himself much more freely if only our sight 
and scent were sharp enough to detect the fragments. Even the fish leave a trail in the water, and it is said the otter will pursue them by it. The birds make a track in the air, only the enemies hunt by sight rather than by scent. The fox baffles the hound most upon a hard crust of frozen snow. The scent will not hold to the smooth, bead-like granules. Judged by the eye alone, the fox is the lightest and most buoyant creature that runs. His soft wrapping of fur conceals the muscular play and effort that is so obvious in the hound that pursues him. And he comes bounding along precisely as if blown by a gentle wind. His massive tail is carried as if it floated upon the air by its own lightness. The hound is not remarkable for his fleetness, but how he will hang often running late into the night and sometimes till morning, from ridge to ridge, from peak to peak, now on the mountain, now crossing the valley, now playing about a large slope of uplying pasture fields. At times the fox has a pretty well-defined orbit, and the hunter knows where to intercept him. Again he leads off like a comet, quite beyond the system of hills and ridges upon which he was started, and his return is entirely a matter of conjecture. But if the day be not more than half spent, the chances are that the fox will be back before night though the sportsman's patience seldom holds out that long. The hound is a most interesting dog. How solemn and long-visaged he is! How peaceful and well-disposed! He is the Quaker among dogs. All the viciousness and currishness seem to have been weeded out of him. He seldom quarrels or fights or plays like other dogs. Two strange hounds meeting for the first time behave as civilly toward each other as if two men. I know a hound that has an ancient, wrinkled, human, faraway look that reminds one of the bust of Homer among the Elgin marbles. He looks like the mountains towards which his heart yearns so much. The hound is a great puzzle to the farm dog. The latter, attracted by his baying, comes barking and snarling up through the fields, bent on picking a quarrel. He intercepts the hound, snubs and insults, and annoys him in every way possible but the hound heeds him not. If the dog attacks him, he gets away as best he can, and goes on with the trail. The cur bristles and barks and struts about for a while, then goes back to the house, evidently thinking the hound a lunatic, which he is for the time being, a monomaniac the slave and victim of one idea. I saw the master of a hound one day arrest him in full course to give one of the hunters time to get to a certain runaway. The dog cried and struggled to free himself, and would listen neither to threats nor caresses. Knowing he must be hungry, I offered him my lunch, but he would not touch it. I put it in his mouth, but he threw it contemptuously from him. We coaxed and petted and reassured him, but he was under a spell. 
he was bereft of all thought or desire but the one passion to pursue that trail. End of Fox and Hound Recording by Robert Scott Mojo Move 411.com M O J O M O V E 411.com September the 22nd, 2007